First, let's just indulge slightly more on those Chelsea years and your your brothers in arms, in actual fact, and and Hutch and Od, Osgood in particular. Yeah, um, great subject. Hutch and Oz uh, were. I've never seen anything like it. Any any football club I've been at, it was. Um, if if you can imagine two players being thrown together, one from the Southern League. The Southern League in in those days were for players who were had either retired and they'd gone to last. Uh, you know, like putting a horse out the stud, really. Uh, and they the, the old for older players and and for younger players come through, they probably put them in to. To toughen them up because there were that was one tough league, you know. Yeah. Uh, my I'd see my brother playing it, and my brother played against Hutch uh, in that league, and uh, I would if I was speaking to my friend Jeff Powell, yes, who played with my brother. We did a podcast together, and uh, I swear I said Jeff, I wouldn't have gone down that route if I if I would have got turned away at the top level, then I would have gone window cleaning with my father. There's no way I'd have played. I wouldn't have gone out on in the Southern League and played, mate. But Hutch came from the Southern League and he brought the Southern League into our Chelsea team and that's what we needed. We need... Aussie needed someone along... I mean, Aussie could handle himself, yep. don't get me wrong. But, but Hutch, Hutch was like his minder. Uh, Aussie was bigger than him, taller than him and he, he could look after himself, I was good, but... Hutch watched his back wherever he went all over the field. And if anyone, you know, I, I, I've seen Hutch many a time just glare at center halves when they, they, they hit Aussie. And, the, you know, I, I remember the, the, the instance at Nottingham Forest when someone, so big Sammy Chapman, did something and he's a big, big, mean center half. And uh, the, in, in a flurry, in 60 seconds, Sammy was carried off on a stretcher and Hutch was walking beside him with a broken arm being being red carded. Uh, but that's how tough he was, Hutch, you know. But he brought that into our team and give us that. I wouldn't say he was inspiring, but he was a great outlet for us. You know, when when Charlie and I couldn't play, we could, we, we could just throw it up in the air and there would be Hutch, you know. Now, many years later, you were bumped into Sammy and uh, you recalled the story about that incident with him, didn't you? I did. I reminded him that he forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sam, Sam, Sammy uh, kind of uh, he blanked that one. He smiled. He smiled, <laughs> I think. Uh, uh, but, but no, it, it, any, any, I, I, I've got to say that... Uh, I laugh. I I I don't laugh about it. I I smile about it yeah. because I I loved Hutch. I loved him dearly, and uh, he went off the rails a bit. I, I we all went off the rails in certain ways, but there's uh, there's a certain limit. And but he 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 took it to the ultimate limit, you know. Uh, but on the field, um, I don't think there was a centre half in the country one on one that would have would have got the better of Hutch. Now, going back to that game that, that, that you and your dad uh, watched your, your brother John play for Guildford against Burton, your dad was absolutely enamoured with uh, Hutch. Um, I read your piece, you do some wonderful writings in your uh, on your Facebook page and then Thank on your you official know. page as well. And um, I love the way that... Because when you write out, when you write... When you wrote the working man's ballet, it really is you. You read and you read between the lines, like you used to play the ball between the lines, and you almost feel as though you're there at the time. And you can imagine your dad walking back through the door and and talking about this player. And your mum says, "Blimey, I've never heard you say that about another player apart from Alan and John before." And well, that, yeah, that's the yeah. impact, isn't it? Well, no, it was just it, mm-hmm. I was I was a guy was a kid. I yeah. was a, I actually weren't in the game, Paul. But right, okay. um, I was playing myself on mm-hmm. in the in Chelsea reserves or youth team or yeah. whatever. My brother was uh, going to sign pro and I, under Docky and Docky reneged on the deal, and led to problems with him and my father. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um, my my old man knew what he was doing. He it, 
you know, you read the thing about he went up for the coaching thing and he yeah. he, he he walked out on, you know, they asked him to make a cup of tea and he, he, for everyone and he says, no, he says, I don't even do that at home. I haven't come here to make tea. I've come here to get a badge, you know, and he, and he walked out. So that I think that's where I probably got it without knowing it. But uh, but this particular morning it was a, it was a Sunday morning as usual. His best mate was a fella called Arthur Bell, and he would come round and see. He was Chelsea mad. We were full of mad. He shouldn't have been talking about <laughs> that in our kitchen because uh, we were full of. And he was Jimmy Greaves mad, and he was always on about Jimmy Greaves. And my dad had stopped him. All right, Arthur, enough's enough, enough. He said, he says, you wait to Alan wears his, his number eight shirt. You, you'll see a player. And he says, and, oh, by the way, I see a, a, a fella play yesterday against John. And he didn't rave about him. Yeah. Um, he just told him exactly what it was. He just he just come out. He, he said, I, I, because my father was supposed to have been a bit of a handful on the field. And uh, I suppose that was what he caught his eye, especially in that league, in that southern league. You really had to be able to handle yourself. And and uh, as I say, I see a couple of matches and it was quite scary. Mm. Uh, and he just said... Um, there's as absolute this this kid could be anything. He he was no Osgood. He was a complete opposite of Osgood. He was no he was never gonna be a Jimmy Green. His control wasn't great. He wasn't he need he was a raw, raw it, it, actually that's what I, I think my dad might have said. He's he's raw and there's no there's no telling what he could be if a good manager if someone like Waddington had got hold of him, he'd have he'd he'd have made him in, into it had got the very best out of him, let's put it that way. And he, I think he, Hutch would have played a lot longer under Waddington because he would have sat him down and said, look now, Ian, you don't get no medals. You don't get for putting your head where you shouldn't, you, you know, falls rush in. Yep. Don't get your head kicked off. Don't go in there. Don't, you know, you know, be a bit cagier about it where Hutch would just rush in and, smash defenders and go in between you know you've never seen anyone so so brave and irresponsible mate it was it scared me he really scared me and i and it was and and his career was for, for somebody who was legendary at chelsea he only played for about 18 months yeah it's almost like a tragedy isn't it and that leads us to our first record from the bg's tragedy and we're still going to stay with hutch because you know his career, it, it was a bit of a tragedy, wasn't it? The way that, as you've alluded to, he got injured where there's times he shouldn't have gone in. You know, he almost caused riots on the pitch as well, didn't he, when he'd be pushed Billy Bremner over in that replay. And... Well, he, 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 he gave, he, I mean, I remember, I remember the scene. I, I, I mean, I watched that, I watched that, I watched that cup final replay. I was in a blur yeah. and, uh, through missing it. And I was really upset and I, you know, I couldn't handle the situation really. Mm-hmm. I, I'd seen the replay uh, yeah. once and, uh, and Bremner was on his knees and Hutch just looked down at him and I, I could read his lips. Uh, and he just was kind of telling him that, look, that, this, you know, this wasn't all about Leeds. Uh, he was, he was, he, we really give it to Bremner. And uh, you see the one where Dave Mackay picked him up. Well, Hutch was telling him uh, verbally that, you know, that he was kind of warning him. You, it was like a gangster movie, really. Yeah. That you, this is your one last chance. You will get it, Billy, you know. Yeah. Um, and it, and he like mimicked with his hand uh, yeah. at Bremner and Bremner was on his knees and I, uh, uh, that could have turned the game, you know, because yes. um, things like that in games and because people like Bremner and Giles, you know, they're they're okay when they're intimidating people and they're, uh, but you know, Leeds were bullies, there's no doubt about it. Um, but when they couldn't bully you, they you were on an even playing field, and uh, Hutch kind of made that very clear to them. And uh, you know, he he was a fantastic leader of. of you know, he scored the equaliser at Wembley, and then he went on. He took the throw. He threw it for a million miles for the yeah. for the winner. Uh, you know, as I say, he was was not the talented, most talented footballer in the world. If you, he wouldn't get in a he wouldn't get in a Manchester City or Liverpool team today because he couldn't play that lovely intricate football they play. The the lovely one twos and all that. But 
when you needed him, mate, he was a great get-out ball, you know. If ever I got in trouble on the field and it was too tight and there was nothing on, Hutch was always on the back of my mind, you know, and he would spring to the front of my mind and I'd just put it up there and there he'd be, you know. And also tragedy in the the last time that you uh, saw the big fella as well. It was, you know, heartbreaking, wasn't it? Oh, it was... um... I had just come out of um, my, not long been out of my coma and I've been through all that trauma and, but I was, I was uh, pretty much fine, you know, yeah. uh, I, I came through uh, that they were frightened I had the, about the, I had a blood clot on the brain and that, that worried them for a while and a lot of people said I didn't have no brain, but um, that, that's another story. Uh, but I kind of came through and I was I was going along all right and I heard that Hutch was in hospital and I said to my uncle, I was on my crutches at the time and uh, I said, we must go and see him, you know, uh, a bit worried about him, blah, blah. I hadn't seen him for a while, obviously. And I uh, got there and he still had his film star good looks. Yeah. Uh, he looked he looked uh, absolutely it was like a film scene when I walked into the ward he, he looked fantastic I, I, I thought he was kidding me Paul he looked yeah. at me and he smiled out the corner of his eye and I and I didn't uh, and then I realized that he didn't really recognize me and it was uh, you know he, he had such a cheeky way about him Hutch and it was a, it was a lovely lovely fellow he drove in, uh, the, the story goes, he drove into Stanford Bridge on a motorbike with a leather jacket thinking he was like Jack Nicholson, you know, yeah. and uh, and he was told straight away and within six months we had bred a monster. Um, I think that's the right way, how it goes. And uh, But he was a lovely, he was a lovely lad and but we walked out of the hospital and I said to my uncle George, I said, we've got to get out of here. And then the nurse said, please don't, we can't handle him. Don't go. I said, well, I can't handle him, love. I said, I don't think he realises that he doesn't know I am. And mm-hmm. well, it was a very, very sad moment. Uh, and the last time I see him and I went up, the next time I, I was just hugged his girlfriend at the memorial or, or whatever, you know. And it was it was a very sad moment. It was a, it was a tragic, absolute tragedy because not only his career... You know, you can imagine coming from Burton Albion and you you yeah. win the FA Cup with Chelsea. He must have been a, when he must have went home to Burton and and been a hero, you know. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, it all ended in tears. But he was a teetotal, and he was a family loving guy with a beautiful wife that he adored, and vice versa. And you know, within eighteen months, you're turning him to a womanising alcoholic, hadn't you? you guys well, that the was they road. were they, they were. I, I, I must take responsibility for that. You can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but that's what Chelsea was about, and the King's Road was about. And what I'm trying to get at, Al, is you know when, when players are born to play at clubs and and are conducive with what they've got to play at clubs, you know. If you're not that kind of player, that club and that lifestyle can consume you and really change you in an well, instant. Well, I, I, I put Paul, yeah. I, you've hit something on the head there. Mm. I mean, it wasn't so much uh, if you was a good player or not yeah. at Chelsea. It was if you could stand the test yep. of the King's Road. Yep. If you could come, if you could overcome the King's Road and. I mean, Charlie Cook and uh, and Tommy Baldwin down the King's Road, they, they'd be arm wrestling with Richard Harris, Peter O'Toole, uh, um, Oliver Reed at three o'clock in the morning down the King's Road, drunk with these people, and, and then come in training and tell us the story. Where you been? He said, and Charlie would say, oh, he's been with Richard Harris, the man called Horse, you know, uh, and, and you know, at three o'clock in the morning, and it's, Charlie came down from Scotland. He was the most. He was. He was the closest thing ability-wise to George Best, and yeah. he was amazing, amazing, amazing talent. But he, he went down that King's Road, and you could see it was. It, it had such an a, a effect on him. He there was moments of his his magic, like in the the, the Cup final replay. But that that one bit of magic came from him. He was he was still had the magic, but it, he 
And then he came off the booze completely, and I played against him in in America for California, and he he had that sparkle back, and you know he was a he was an amazing talent. But the King's Road, King's Road, he couldn't he he took on the King's Road, and he and he beat him. I think the King's Road beat many, as did Chelsea. Your iconic team beat many. Hutch, although he did go to Chelsea, almost never. Well. It wasn't an almost, but your dad did tell Bobby Robson on a train journey with you on the way to Ibury um, that Fulham should have a look at him as he did with you. But strangely, Fulham didn't with both and you both ended up Chelsea legends. But I suppose that's the way it is, isn't it? Some listen, some don't. Well, absolutely. I mean, I know that's just, that's I think yeah. that is that is a way of life. Uh, yeah. Going back to yesterday with this thing with Jeff, I did, you know, we talk about how one man can change the, the, your path in life. One yeah. manager, uh, wrongly so, which I'm I'm so against management yeah. in that way and suits. Uh, they they can they can ruin you, and one man shouldn't have that much power. Um, and my my father very innocently, uh, Bobby Robson was manager of Fulham. We got on a train after a match at Arsenal. We took there for my education. I watched George Easton. Uh, and we got on the train and Bobby Robson, being the manager of Fulham, my father, he, was a, he wasn't one of those pe- people that were going to go and pester you or nothing. He, he, you know, he was very much, I would, I'm very much like him. Uh, and, he, and he just said, Bobby, can I have a minute of your time? If I can tell you about this kid, I'll see on Saturday play against my son. And uh, he said, if I can say, you, you should go send someone to go and see him. He said, because we need somebody up front to, yeah. to play that. I think they had uh, Alan Clark at one time. They had Rodney Marsh at one time. Malcolm McDonald had a spell. Uh, but they, Hutch would have been, uh, uh, he would have been, if he kept himself fit and gone to Fulham. And my, my dad kind of threw in a, a sideline with him and said, uh, um, "Oh, by the way, this is my son. He's apprentice at Chelsea, and uh, his ambition is to play for Fulham." And it went over his head. It was sad, really. It was. Yeah. It was. Sad. And then years later, I, he came on a tour with with Stoke City. This is ten, twelve years later, and uh, fifteen years later, and, and he'd been England manager and everything else. And he was rated one of the greatest coaches in the world, Bobby Robson, and. Uh, and he looked at me a couple of times. And I, he was up with us for about eight days, and I couldn't, I couldn't get get some get the strength to speak to him. I, I would just, mm. I thought, if you can't speak to your, my father, then you can't speak to me, kind of thing, you know. But one man that did always listen, and that leads us into Sea Biscuit territory, was Tony Waddington, because your story is very much like Sea Biscuit. So let's indulge firstly about Sea Biscuit and tell the listeners who Sea Biscuit was, because before I started doing the podcast with you, Alan, talking to you and reading your your almost your scriptures. I didn't know who Sea Biscuit was, but he changed the he changed the attitude of a nation, didn't he? It's incredible. Well, it's uh, I've, um, for those who are not into horse racing. I love my horse racing. I, I love. I'm I'm not uh, I'm not a, 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 a total nutcase about it, but I I do. They, they fascinate horses. Fascinate me. I love. I loved. I loved. Uh, I, I. I once had a had a horse. We rented a horse off Red Yolling's egg called uh, My Lifetime Lady, who's who's the greatest, the only female that broke my heart really when I lost her. Um, and I, I just. I, I love watching them on the gallops. I love watching them. They fascinate me. They got these legs which I don't know understand how they carry that much weight on the. And that they're they're so honest. They're so brave. They're wonderful animals, uh, and I, 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 I read about Sea Biscuit. I went to Sea Biscuit Day in Santa Anita when I come out of hospital, and uh, I, I followed the story, see the film, and yeah, it's just a, it's just a, the story was so much like what happened to me uh, with Tony because it was a horse. It was in the depression, wasn't it? The Wall yeah, it Street, yeah. Wall Street had crashed. Um, the jockeys fire. Everybody had gone skint apart from, you know, the certain ones who, who were luck, who were fortunate. Uh, and uh, 
unbeknown to anyone, this this you couldn't plan it again, it, like you couldn't plan what me and Tony coming together. It was every it was just unseen what what Tony done. How he paid so much money for me when I was broken down and paid a record fee for a player that was out of form and falling out of love with a game and going nowhere. And he sees something in me like Tom Smith see in Seabiscuit. And he said in the film that the, and that, well, the, the fellow that spoke, uh, the narrator, he, he said that Tom Smith looked, they looked through each other, him and the horse. Yeah. They they walked the horse in the through the dark in a training session, and he caught they they both they, it was on film. He looked at him and and he told the he told uh, Charles Howard the, the the man with the money. He says I, I think we should buy this horse, and he said but the horse is broken down. He says I can fix him, and uh, he fixed him, and he got his com he got him he got his confidence back because it was a top rated horse as a young horse, and he got injured. And then what happened was it was much like me again. It, you, I got injured and I got ignored. I got I got pushed into the background and no treatment and lack of treatment. So I fell out with a manager. I fell out with two managers over it. And this can happen. And Seabiscuit could have so easily just been forgotten. And that they put it in races that were worth like. Hundred pound races, and it went on to win the million pound race. Yeah, uh, all because of this this one man that saved him, and it, it was Sea Biscuit. You know, is is such an inspiration, uh, and and it gives as as Charles Howard said. You know, if a horse can do to this this to our nation, then our nation can pick itself up because a little horse like this has has proved that he can beat man of war. Who was a massive, massive horse? It was an unbeatable horse. Well, he proved that it wasn't. You know, this little horse who, who got it, he was brought back to life. He got him, he got fit again, and he broke his leg again, and then he came back again, and he, he proved that he won the Santa Anita Derby, the handicap there, and it's 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 a, it's a wonderful story. It, it really is. In many ways, it's the greatest story ever about the triumph of an underdog, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I, I've got the other, I've got the other, the one about the, the, the great, they say the greatest horse that won all, the, won all them races. Um, I've, I've actually got it over the back there, sitting there. Uh, but Seabiscuit was, you know, they can, they can't, they can argue, they, you can talk about footballers and, uh, and say who was the best player. No one will ever know who's the best, but as regards what, Sea biscuit went through, and uh, the heartbreak it must. Uh, I mean, it it is. It really does make you think. If only a, a horse could talk. Yeah, and if he, if that horse could talk and tell you the pain that it went through, and and how he, you know, he could tell. He, like I speak of Tony Waddett, and that horse would talk about Tom Smith and tell you that he saved not only his life but. It, it took him to such heights, you know. But that's what Tom did, didn't he? He whispered to the horse. I mean, this was, to all intents and purposes at, at that time, a crazy horse. The, the horse would go mad. It would bite people. But, but Tom, just as you say, they looked at each other. They connected with each other. He fed the horse. He whispered in the horse. And, and he, he built the horse to be the greatest horse on the planet. It just well, is yeah, an incredible I mean, story. It, <laughs> in, the film, in the film, the, the, it was kicking the doors yeah. down in his store and and they were putting they were putting all animals in in to, to be with him to try and calm him down and these animals were being thrown over the top of the, the store and kept flying over people's heads and then one day he, he walked in and brought this great big horse lovable horse and he and he sat a big white horse and he sat it down next to sea biscuit and it calmed him down and it kind of, you know, when you think that they, they don't talk, they must, it's like yeah. probably a dolphin. I don't know. Yeah. You know, they reckon they send these signs out. And the, someone was telling me the other day about that. They, they took their kid over to, you know, um, his, um, this little girl to, to see the dolphins because she's, she's, um, 
she's, she's got the same thing as my my, my little nephew um, and it kind of cured the little girl to a certain extent yeah where they're just just getting in the water with a dog going around with the dolphins and the, you know it, it, the effect it had on this little girl and it and it makes you wonder and the, the horses you know they have this wonderful way about them you know I, I've spoke to several jockeys and you know the, the, that you can you can understand I fell in love with a horse when I had my horse I mean I couldn't wait to get up in the morning and go down the yard and see her and all that and it was just it it was it's more than any I, I've got to say mate it, I, it's more than any woman mm. a two-year-old she was a two-year-old filly and it, it, if I'd have had a daughter I, I couldn't have showed her any more affection it was it was just incredible the way they are um you can see why people fall in love you can see why people pay some I mean a lot of people pay money to earn money out of them but uh it's it's an incredible you can see why people go there and they stand around a paddock and watch watch these wonderful animals walk by you know but it is incredible that you know if you treat people or treat animals or treat anything with the respect with the love with the tender care it's it's quite incredible what results that you can get and that is pretty much what tony waddington did to you um a little old wine drinking me d martin that's a song and, and a song that reminds you of the time when you went back to chelsea for stoke scored the goal that got stoke into uh, europe with a one nil away win and that you were waiting for the train and the gaffer turns up with a crate of champagne and sorts all you boys out and sticks an extra one in your bag looks at you smiles just like tom did to see biscuit and you guys were just up and running and you could, I don't think there's an argument, I don't think anybody would say anything different, that you played your best football at Stoke and that was because of a guy that connected with you, that got to the inner Alan Hudson, water pitches for you, done everything for you put you on that football pitch, made you the, well, you, you made yourself the greatest midfield player in the world at that time. And how could you not repay somebody with that faith in you? And I think that's a great lesson in life for all of us. A Serbian media. But I, I think um, <clears throat> there, there, there's, a, there's a lesson to be learned uh, here because I, I have a lot of problem with, my for, my my former teammates at Stoke City. Yeah, I know. And uh, they weren't very happy when Tony brought me into the club. Mm-hmm. They they didn't like that. They didn't like what they read about me. They didn't know me. They played again. I played against them a few times. They thought I was. I don't know. I, I'm very self confident. I'm not arrogant. Yeah. Um, and uh, what they don't understand, these people, and I've told them, I've told them, and I write certain things, and I've. I send it to them, actually, and I make sure that they see it, that what Tony did for me, um, they thought Tony was going out of his way to do this just for me because he paid a lot of money for me, and he, they thought that he had to make it work for me because his head was on the line because he paid then a quarter of a million pound, which was a record signing, the most money ever paid, they thought he was under pressure, so he had to get the best out. Well, that was nonsense. That yeah. was absolute, complete nonsense. What they didn't understand was, and Tony told me one day, um, I went in to see him one day about uh, one of our players complaining about that he wouldn't let him, Jackie Marsh, wouldn't, they wouldn't let him go. We were sitting having a pint, and, t- and Jackie said, he, he, the, he won't let me go to Los Angeles in the summer. And I said, well, what's all that about, Jack? And I wasn't captain of the team, and we were sitting next door to Tony's office, basically. He was in the social club. And uh, I said, what's all this about, Jackie? Uh, And I said, before you go any further, if you badmouth him, mate, we don't drink together anymore. I said, because you're out of order, if you're going to say something about somebody, say it to their face. I said, so don't stand sit here doing this. I said, but you, you just tell me. And he told me. And I, I got up and I walked out the bar. And I walked in and knocked on Tony's door. It was only like a, even not even a minute's walk. It was next door to the ground. And I knocked on his door and I sat down with him. And uh, 
he couldn't the only time i'd been in his office apart from a saturday to pick up my tickets and uh i, I was surprised to see him I'd, I'd, I'd only ever seen him in a restaurant and a bar i'd never seen him anywhere else <laughs> and uh and he went, oh, Alan, what can I do for you? To listen to the rest of this podcast, please go to www.patreon.com forward slash SRB Media or just follow the links in the description. Thank you. S-